Praise God. I found that to be so very, very, very true. <clears throat> uh, I love the scripture that says, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Praise God. All right. Uh, anybody got a maybe a testimony? But before we get there, I want to ask you, does anybody have a song? <clears throat> All right. There's one thing missing around here, and I haven't seen it yet, and that's Brandon's saxophone. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know where he's hiding it at, but Brandon, I love to hear a saxophone, and I love to hear you play, so keep that in mind. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, think on that, and uh, if you have a song, we'll have that after a while, but Right now, we have testimonies. Amen. I do know your names, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Joyce, get us started. <laughs> I'm just so thankful for Jesus this morning. Yes. I have a lot to say, but I'm so Bless her, Lord. For the church, that Jesus is yes, thank the Lord. Amen. Go ahead, Gary. Yes, you do. Praise the Lord. I had a rough time this week, but the good Lord was there to help me out and get me through all this, you know, uh -huh. and all that. And, and one other thing, and I'm sure I'm not excuse for this, is I remember a part in the Bible that said that, and it disappoints me that y'all don't have more people, for you certainly deserve them. Uh, and I mean that with all my heart. But the part I was wanting to tell you about is in if I remember right, it said, if three or more of my people are gathered together, then I will be there. Yes, I'll be in the midst. Praise the Lord. Everybody. Amen. And Gary, I'm going to miss my guess if you aren't feeling the Lord's touch right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Yes. Praise God. A lot of prayer gone up for Gary. Yes. <laughs> go, go right ahead, Sister Dora. Gary, I think I'm one of those old women that's had a rough week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had some dental work done this week, and I'm having a hard time talking. But, uh, help I'm her, Jesus. So the way he helped me. Praise I God. I not believe that I've had such a small amount of time. <laughs> Good. And I was just so glad and proud to be there. Praise Thank the you. Lord. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Bless her Lord. Yes, amen. I'm just so grateful that I have my children. Yes. I still have my children. Amen. I just praise him for his faithfulness and love is to me. I just praise him for his protection. You know, Sean had him walking through all these adventures and things. I go crazy sometimes, but the Lord is always there. Praise the Lord. These tornadoes, you know, Lindsay was down in the long way, you know, that's not very far. That's right.
Mm-hmm. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody else? <clears throat> Good. the Lord. I thought as Lori testified about the the mother losing the son uh, just a little less than a year ago. In fact, about a month before Valida passed away our granddaughter Sarah was expecting a baby and I don't know just how far along she was maybe I've forgotten now but anyway uh, the baby came too soon and Everything was going good. Um, doctor's reports were all good. Everything just looked fine. And, and uh, they were at our house that weekend. And uh, I could tell Sarah was concerned and somebody said something to her and she said, I haven't, I haven't felt movement uh, today. And uh, <clears throat> a few days later, they uh, they told her that the baby's heartbeat had quit, and uh, <clears throat> they were going to need to do uh, the cesarean and uh, take the baby. And anyway, uh, she fought such horrible, horrible, horrible depression. Uh, they got got to keep the baby and hold it and whatever uh, for a while before a funeral, but because of the age of the baby in Ohio, they, they did have to have a, a funeral for it. And, and um, we, we had that funeral service and uh, they gave the little guy uh, the name of Ezekiel George. And I felt quite honored about that, but several times during this past year, I've gone up on the hill to the cemetery and sat there in the cemetery beside this little tiny little grave, I mean, a tiny little grave. And um, Sarah and Joey lived all the way up at Zanesville, three hours away from where they had the child buried. And But they <clears throat> did that on purpose because he intended to move back down to Cincinnati area, in, in which, um, as far as I know, they're buying my house. And uh, they came back to stay with me in October. I told them, <clears throat> and, you know, you guys are throwing away $1,500 a month on rent. And um, they were going to have to sign a lease for another year, but I was planning to come down here, as you know, last of December. So I said, why don't you just come stay with me for these couple of months, put your stuff in storage, move in with me, and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll just get by a couple of months. And it turned out to be much longer, of course. But anyway, uh, it seemed to be good for Sarah uh, to be around people and and uh, then she got a job back in the hospital there in in uh, Cincinnati area 
But she was praying, and she had four job offers. Four hospitals offered her jobs all at the same time. And she was praying about, I take it back, there was three that had. And uh, I was a little concerned that she was doing the wrong thing. But what she said was, no, I have this hospital where I feel like the Lord wants me to be. And I, have, I can't give you an answer until I get an answer from that one. And she let them know. She was wait, putting God in the equation. And I was so proud of her for that. But anyway, uh, where do you think she got the job? Right where she wanted to be, about 15 minutes from home. And uh, she loves it. Um, she was trained to work with babies and new mothers and new babies. And I was so afraid after the baby was buried and she had some time off and then had to go to work. And I was so afraid that that was going to keep her upset, seeing all these new babies all the time. But it seemed to be therapy for her. It seemed to be good for her. And uh, her sister-in-law, her brother's sister, her husband's sister, had a baby just about the time that Ezekiel should have been born. And I said, how is she going to stand that? Well, Jacob and Brooke come to, came to the house several times while I was, while they were with me and, and uh, spend some time there. And I just couldn't believe how God would help Sarah to go get this little guy and carry him around and talk to him, play with him. And seemed like, again, he was good therapy for her. The thing I feared was going to be a hindrance turned out to be a blessing. And so uh, she's expecting again, and she's supposed to deliver a child again about the time that she lost that one last year. And uh, they are so extremely excited. I don't know how to tell you. And so if you think about Sarah, we should pray. Seems like everything is going good so far. The baby's healthy and good, strong heartbeat. And they say the only problem, it seems like he's growing too fast. And uh, anyway, uh, so he's supposed to be born sometime the very first part of June, last of May somewhere. But uh, I would appreciate prayer because she still has her days when she fights depression over all of this and and uh, but God is extremely good and so all of these difficult places that we bump into during life um, God can use them if we let him and uh, brother Crabtree back at the first church that I pastored had an expression I've heard it from others as well but uh, Brother Robert would always say, uh, he was kind of an illiterate fellow, and he'd say, let's, uh, let's just take those stumbling blocks and make stepping stones out of them. And uh, I think that's a good idea. All right. If you have your Bibles, <clears throat> uh, I hope not to be real lengthy. This morning, I, I had wanted, I really did want to preach about Joseph this morning. I wanted to preach about forgiveness this morning, um, forgiving others. And I think uh, the two greatest examples that I know of outside of the Lord's forgiveness in the Bible is the story of Joseph forgiving his brothers and uh, Esau and Jacob when they came together. And uh, he had sworn that he was going to kill Jacob, Esau had, but... Uh, apparently forgave him at least the extent that they could get along for the time. If you have your Bibles, I want to uh, go, though, to the book of Esther. Brother Jack mentioned the other night, I believe, that Esther was probably his favorite book. I don't know if that prompted my thinking, Brother Jack, but anyway, I've spent some time <clears throat> thinking about Esther, and uh, I... Uh, I want to try to draw our attention to just a part of that story. And the story starts a way back, of course, but uh, as you know that 
Esther was Mordecai's cousin, and the scripture said, uh, let's see if I can go back and pick that up. Uh, I'm not sure where, where it's even at now. I can't, can't think where it's at. But anyway, Mordecai was uh, evidently carried away from uh, his native land of, of Jerusalem area, uh, Palestine, and he was carried into captivity to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he, uh, along with many others, of course, was, was taken captive. And I presume that Esther was as well. The Bible doesn't really say about Esther. What it does say, that her mother and dad were dead. And uh, Mordecai took her to himself as a daughter, and uh, though she were was uh, not not a, a child of his, but anyway, that he cared for her, cared very much for her. And process of time, the uh, Vashti, the the queen, was disposed and and uh, removed from being the queen, and and uh, the king was not a good man. He in fact, if you read history about him, you find out he's a very wicked fellow. But uh, <clears throat> Esther, through the providence of the Lord, became the new queen. The uh, there's a, a problem going on in the in the land. There's a guy that's so so upset with the Jews that he wants all of them dead, and uh, and Haman would. Uh, just go to any length to make sure that the Jews were punished uh, in this land. And, and so he does his best to turn the king against them and, and he gets a decree made and all this sort of thing. But uh, I'm taking up reading here in the fourth chapter and about the 15th verse, if you want to be turning there. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> Mordecai, recognizes that there's only one hope uh, for the Jews. And he, of course, he was a Jew. And the only hope that any of them are going to live is if the king would, uh, would step in and take action. And, and uh, he has no way of communicating with the king except through Esther, who now is the queen. But... Uh, to set this up a little bit before I begin to read, even the queen could not go before the king except she was invited to come. And so uh, that's where we find the story this morning. The 15th verse of chapter 4, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, and he had sent an, an, a request for her to go before the king. And she said, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and that are uh, in fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, <laughs> and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Fifth chapter. Now it came to pass in the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of, his, of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to her Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. Amen. And uh, I'm going to leave off reading right there. The uh, for now, the uh, <clears throat> the setting of of what we're reading here, we find Esther fearful. Uh, she felt like at first she just couldn't do this thing until 
Mardikei, I pressed upon her the urgency of the matter, and, and then she said, of course, as you remember, uh, I'll go, and if I perish, I perish. The, uh, she puts on a royal apparel, and we know from previous reading uh, that, uh, that Qu Queen Esther was a beautiful young lady, uh, probably quite young at this time. She goes before the uh, king's house, not before the king, but before the king's house. She's wearing her royal apparel. She's all dressed up as beautiful as she can be, but she dare not just make an entrance like that uh, for the sake of her own life, even though she's the queen. She goes, and uh, probably the Lord gave her this wisdom, but the king's sitting on his throne, and he's sitting where he can look out through the gate into the outer court, and Esther goes and stands on the other side of the court, but directly in his light, line of sight. The uh, king sees her standing there and bids her to come, holds out the golden scepter to her, which is the only, only token of acceptance that she would have. And so she goes to him and he asks her what, uh, what her request is. She tells him and even before she told him what his request, her request was, the king says, I'll give you whatever you ask, even half my kingdom. Very generous. Uh, and then she tells him what the request is. A few things I want to notice, want us to notice here is that Esther was willing to lay her life on the line she was willing to risk all in order to get her petition granted. She was not coming necessarily for herself, even though she was a Jewess, uh, but she was coming in behalf of all the people of the Jews, all the population. She was coming in the interest of others, and she's willing to lay down her life for her people. Uh, that, of course, reminds us of what Jesus did for us. And uh, I think in this, this sense, she was a type of Christ. But she comes, uh, and I want, I want us to notice something that I had not noticed before and never thought of before, as far as I know. But the king accepted her uh, just because he saw her there, just because he knew that she wanted something. He doesn't know what she wants. He doesn't have any idea what her request is, but he sees her there and he knows he recognizes that she has a need, otherwise she wouldn't be there. And so he invites her to come, and in her coming, uh, the king already knew that he was going to accept what she has to say to him before she says it. Otherwise, he would have never said, I'll give you half my kingdom. And as she is coming, she's coming knowing that she has been accepted. She's coming in full assurance. I think when as, as the king bid her to come that Fear went out of her heart. I think that she became, as scripture would say, she waxed very bold in that moment because here is the king, the one that has the power to take her head off, to kill her any way he sees fit, and, uh, and he would be justified in doing that under their law. But he... He is looking at her, and he has accepted her. I mentioned the other night about coming into the throne room of heaven, and I think that uh, this would apply to us as well. But here's Queen Esther coming, not pleading for her own case. She's involved, but she's pleading for all of the people, all of the Jews, and they're going to be annihilated. They're going to be killed to the last Jew in the country. Now, we don't know how many people um, 
necessarily that was carried away in captivity uh, to Babylon, but all of those people now have lived there for a little while, and they've uh, they've put down roots and they become a part of the population. And and uh, but now all at once, because of the hatred of one man, they're about to be all slain. Uh, then I want to read another portion of scripture for us over in Matthew. I think it's the 26th chapter, yes. Um, <clears throat> there's another setting that I think correlates with this one or relates to this one. Matthew 26, I'm reading from verses 36 through 42. And I have to back up a page here. <clears throat> yes, Matthew 26, 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And we recognize this to be on, on his last night uh, to be alive. He has been in the upper room with the disciples. He has talked to them. Uh, <clears throat> Judas uh, has gone out and betrayed him or is in the process of betraying him. And Jesus leaves the and he has talked to them and gone over several things that he had explained and talked to them about before, about his death and about his going away and his coming back again. And now we find him over in the place called Gethsemane, which is uh, across a deep, deep valley uh, from Jerusalem <clears throat> over on, on the opposite hill. And when, uh, when I was there about 10 years ago, we arrived uh, near Jerusalem in the late afternoon. Um, sun was just starting to go down, and uh, they parked the big old tour bus over there. and And uh, the guide said to us, "What I why we are here is, I want you to see Jerusalem as the sun goes down, and." Uh, I want you to understand that this is known as the Golden City. And he said, every building that's built by a Jew in this city is the same color. Every one. And when the sun shines on it in the afternoon, it will look like pure gold. And it was a beautiful sight. Uh, we were setting at that time, he didn't tell us right then, but we were setting real close to the Garden of Gethsemane, just down under, on, down the hill, just under it, and uh, looking across the Cadron Valley over to Jerusalem and the Eastern Gate. Uh, <clears throat> later on, we'll come back to this spot uh, after several days. But Jesus is there now in the Scripture. And he said, Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Set ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And uh, <clears throat> I, I want us to notice that phrase. Let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And... Uh, <clears throat> And he cometh unto the disciples, or unto his disciples, the disciples, says, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? And this is the man that made all of his boasts earlier of what he would do and wouldn't do. And then he gives them this uh, admonition, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And how much Peter needed this admonition at this point, just a, 
just a few hours from now, he's going to really, really uh, be in a situation where it would have been better if he'd have stayed awake and prayed. <clears throat> and Jesus said, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. I mentioned... Uh, a few services back at least about the rock uh, there that they built the building on the corner uh, the corner of the building on that rock and supposedly that's where Jesus prayed this prayer <clears throat> and he said except I drink it and then he said thy will be done again I want us to I want to point out that when Jesus was coming before the Father on this night that he was coming not so much for himself as he was all the people of the world. He's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders that night, and as he comes, uh, yes, he's concerned about the disciples, and no doubt there's a, uh, a certain amount of human dread in him about the consequences of the cross. It's not like he doesn't know what crucifixion on a cross is, is to be like. It isn't like that uh, he hadn't seen others die there, no doubt, during the years. He knew from the time he left heaven to come and be born a babe in the manger, he knew what his final end was going to be. He, he understood full well that he would be giving his life for the whole world. But he comes this, this particular night praying, uh, <clears throat> If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but as thou will. And he is coming, making a petition uh, for the loss of the world, every one of us included. And here we find that he's suffering intense agony. Uh, this is my personal opinion, but I felt for many 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 years that that the cross wasn't so hard to bear because he had settled it in gethsemane he knew what he was going to do at the cross it was settled there was no turning back there was no no question but what he would do his father's will but he he had a place where he had to settle that and uh if i could move uh, more in our direction from the scriptures now, I would tell us that that's exactly what every one of us have to do. It's just what Esther and Jesus both did when they came and just presented themselves with uh, not knowing exactly what the future would hold, not knowing exactly what was going to be happening as far as Esther and her people were concerned. But she knew that her one hope, Mordecai had made that clear to her, the one hope that we, the Jews have is through you and what you do. And uh, Jesus came bearing our burden before the Father, but we know that what becomes of us depended entirely on what he did our eternal destiny was hanging in the balance as jesus came before the father and he came praying not my will but thine be done jesus could easily pray that way because he knew what the father's will was he knew for god so loved the world that he would give his only begotten son that was settled a long time before this, back in the council rooms of heaven somewhere. That was already eternally settled. And Jesus knew, but he's coming in our behalf. Praise the Lord. And uh, as we come to the Lord, folk, we have to come in a very similar manner, laying down our life, giving all to Jesus, the songwriter said. We have to come willing to surrender all to him and uh, not fearing the future. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I didn't know what the future was. And 
I uh, have a good friend who said that when she came to the Lord, she said, I can't do it. I just can't do it. She knew what the Lord was requiring, and she said, I can't do it. Three or four nights later, she went back to the same altar and said, yes, Lord, yes, I will. And he saved her that very night, and she lived for the Lord uh, all the rest of her life. But uh, we come to him, and we have all kinds of questions. We worry about our friends. We worry about our families. We we don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I was talking to Bruce yesterday, and uh, I was telling him about a little bit about my family. And I was the first one that that uh, of my siblings that started out for the Lord. And I had a little sister who had been saved when she was like fifth or sixth grade in school, lived for the Lord for a while, and then went back. And when she did, she turned to horrible, horrible, horrible sin um, to the point that, as far as I know, and I've maybe mentioned it before, but... Um, and the lady and I counted up one time, and the best we could figure, she had been married 16 times that we knew of, and who knows how many other times. But uh, um, I thank the Lord that as far as I know now, she says she's saved, and as far as I know she is, and she's been with this fella for 30 years, I guess, and and she seemed to uh, have settled down from some of that. But she, during her young years, she just, horribly involved in sin and uh, but anyway uh, when I started out for the Lord almost without fail my family had similar comments to this it won't last he can't live it uh, he's crazy he's doing things that are absolutely unnecessary you don't have to do that to please God all all the usual stuff you might imagine and uh, I had two choices. I could either listen to my family and my friends, or I could listen to God. And I chose to pay attention to what God said. And I've never been sorry. Uh, several of my family have all, already gone on to the reward. Some of them I'm absolutely sure in my mind that I'll meet them again. Uh, some I, I wish I was that sure about. But uh, I, I know, folks, that we have to get to a place where we can settle it before God and we go to Him and say, here's my all I'm going through. I, I just uh, live, die, sink, or swim. If I perish, I perish. But I'm going to give it over to you. And Jesus was our greatest example, of course, when He, he came before the Father and said, not my will, but thine be done. Praise the Lord. Not my will, but thine be done. Knowing he was facing a cross, knowing he was facing punishment, knowing that even before this night is over, he's going to be facing some of that. And yet he can come and say, Lord, thy will be done. Praise the Lord. And that's where I think you and I are today. It's exactly how we have to come before him. And uh, with an open heart, an open mind, truly meaning it, whatever it takes, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Praise God. I've been thinking recently, even before I left Ohio, uh, my thought process has run along this line quite a bit. What will it be like for those who have known the truth and chose to go the other way and missed heaven. How horrible the reality of hell will be to those who, who could have done something different and chose not to. And um, I say my mind's been on that, on that thought for several weeks now. And uh, my, I just... I can't imagine what it would be like. And I don't want to experience that. I'll tell you honestly, I, I want to miss it. Praise the Lord. All right, I've given you what the Lord gave me. Let's stand.